Now, tonight I have given out that I was going to speak uh, on the gospel message tonight of the handwriting on the wall. And God willing, I shall undertake that by the help of the Holy Spirit. And then tomorrow night, if the Lord willing, I wish to speak on the will the church go before the tribulation period, or will it remain and go through the tribulation period? And now that's a very vital subject. So let's come out tomorrow night. And the reason I'm turning to these gospel sermons, and instead of the healing for the sick, everything in here has been prayed for. So it, see, it's just the same crowd all, all the time. We done went through them all. They done been prayed for. Ninety percent of them already healed. So the other night, if there would have to be one stranger, we had the most thrilling thing that I've had in many years of the personal coming down of the Holy Spirit just like it did in the Bible. Right here, the noise like a thunder roaring coming out of the heavens and the Spirit of the Lord coming through the building like an unseen wind that was shaking and taking it, the people as he went through. Many of them in here are still witnesses. How many in here was the witness of it? Let's see your hands. Just exactly the way it did on the day of Pentecost. And just praying while in prayer, no emotions are, are out running and, uh, like they did at the day of Pentecost, but the same Holy Spirit came in as a rushing mighty wind with a roar that I thought first when it was coming that it was an airplane that had swept down into the building. And Dr. Lee Vale here thought it was a, sounded like the reversing of the wind in a pipe organ. And he looked around to the organ, and it's an electric organ, you see. Then he heard it was coming from above. It went right down, come down here around the pulpit, and you could just see it. It just waved over the people as it went through. It was a glorious experience I shall never forget. So now, maybe by tomorrow evening, well, maybe if you'll get on the phone and tell the people, bring it in their sick and their afflicted, we'll start back into having prayer, but they must be here between 6.30 and 7 o'clock to receive their prayer. The boys will be giving out the cards at that time. Then they won't interfere with the rest of the meeting when it starts, so it's a song service or whatever more it is. Now we wish to turn tonight in this blessed old Bible to the book of Daniel, the fifth chapter and the twenty-fifth verse for the scripture reading. And many of you keep these scriptures down, so you might underline it if you wish to. And this is the writing that was written, Meany, Meany, Tekel of Harrison. Just a few words that I wish to call your attention to, and the prophet goes ahead to give out the interpretation of the word, the kingdom is divided and it's been given into the hands of the Medes and Persians, and so forth. But now while we're speaking on this, it come on my heart that this would be a, a very unusual but a timely message for the people. And now any Bible reader here knows that all Scripture has a compound meaning. Every prophecy, some, most all of it, has a dual, uh, a dual, a time that are two times or more that will be answered as a revolving of history. Now, like in the Bible, we find out that in Matthew, the first chapter or the second chapter, it's written, "Out of Egypt I have called my son," as the prophet said. Well, now, really, if you run your margin reading back to that, it'll go back to where God called uh, his prophet, Jacob, his son, out of Egypt. But it also meant that he called his son, Jesus, out of Egypt. And not only that, but many scriptures has two times answering for the prophecy. And we find out that the Spirit 
of man never dies. Now the spirit of righteousness never dies. It comes in as a succession, one after the other. God takes his man, but never his spirit. The spirit was up on Elijah, come on Elisha, come on John the Baptist. And it's predicted to come again in this last day. A mighty minister to rise up and sweep across a message across the world, doing no miracles, just preaching the gospel. Following that is to come a ministry with signs and wonders of following. The Spirit of Christ, which followed the Spirit of John. Always has uh, two answering or more. Now when we find this great day that we're living in, one of the most blessed days of all time for those who are ready to meet God, and one of the most fearful and dreadful hours facing the unbeliever, his destruction is at hand. Satan is going about like a roaring lion, devouring whatever he can to fulfill the scriptures of the Bible. Now we find this great subject tonight, and we're going to talk on Babylon. Now, Babylon is found in the first of the Bible. It's found in the middle of the Bible. It's found in the last of the Bible. So you see, all things began in Genesis. Genesis means the seed, the beginning. Every cult that we have today. Every right thing we have today and every wrong thing we have today started in its early form in Genesis. Chase it down through history and see if that isn't true. And here Babylon begins in Genesis, first called the Gates of Paradise. It was built by Nimrod. And Nimrod was a son of Ham very wicked man who tried to unite the whole nation together under one dominion that was under his, build a great city in a tower, Tower of Babel. And later, after it was called the Gates of Paradise, it was called Babylon Confusion. And if it was once paradise and then turned into confusion, it must be in a backslidden condition to be turned from paradise to confusion. And this great city, it was built in the plains of Shinar, and in this they had all kinds of peculiar doctrines. They worshipped even roots that they found out of the ground. If you've ever read Hostas II Babylons and, and many of the ancient histories, they worship roots, and that's some of the gods that it's believed that Jacob had stole from his father-in-law and taken over, which he had to get rid of later when he went to worship in God. But they had all kinds of little isms and things, all in Babylon. That's why it was called confusion. And now, let's take a look at this big city. It was built... As I was saying one night before this week in my message, that all things that are on the earth are patterns of things that are in heaven. And if you see a lovely couple, I believe I illustrated it, a young man and a young woman, just in the bloom of life, as they're just to be married, bride and bridegroom, that lovely picture is only, only a reflection of an immortal one. Every tree that you see, it was made off because it's a negative, because it's mortal and has an end. But it was made as a reflection of an immortal one. And we, if this earthly tabernacle or a body dwelling place, be dissolved, we have one already waiting. And in the scriptural terms or the uh, ministerial terms, it's called a theostomy. 
And in this great body that we go into and wait for the resurrection of this body to come back of the dust when Sunday afternoon, the Lord willing, I wish to speak on the subject, why must we be born again? Now, this great city, it was 120 miles around the city. And each side of the city, it was 30 miles from one wall to the end of the other wall, making it 120 miles around. And it had streets in it 200 feet wide, and the walls were 80 feet tall with about 40 feet across the top. Oh, it was a mammoth big place. And each gate was made out of brass. Right in the center of the city set the temple, or the throne. Right by the throne come the river Euphrates. And the river Euphrates, with the tigers, waters the whole Shinar Valley. Great agriculture country. And then each gate that the streets come through entered, went straight to the throne. You see, whichever way you were coming, all roads pointed right to the throne. And in this great city, they had swinging gardens that hung from the walls. And can't you see it's a type of the great celestial city of heaven? Everything the devil has here on earth, he, it's something that's perverted from heaven. That's the reason that this life mortal is a perverted life from the eternal life. But it's made in its likeness. As we were speaking the other night on how that if these great, like Russia, trying to unite everybody under one great head, communism. Well, communism is right, but not forced like that. Russia, communism is only a, a revival of the devil like Pentecost had. Pentecost had real communism. Everybody sold everything freely and divided among them. Now the government is trying to make everybody force everybody and then dominate it under a head that is Russia. Everything that Satan has here on earth, it's something that he's perverted from God. God creates and Satan makes an imitation to it. There's churches today on earth. Great churches, that's controlled by the devil. It's a perversion from the true church of God. Every great denomination is trying to sweep everything into its realm. And when they see they failed on that, Roman Catholicism had their part. But now they're trying to have a confederation of churches and not knowing that the Bible said they would have that. There will be a beast and an image unto the beast. Confederation of churches. And you full gospel people know, you assemblies of God, brethren, when you forfeit your birthrights when you went into it. And that's right. You have to deny your evangelical teaching. Uh, notice, but that has to come. The Bible said it would be there, and there's no way to stop it. That's right. But it's a confederation. Now, Babylon finally winds up in the Roman Empire, as we all know, and the image of that power was made into confederation of churches. And here we got both things right today. See, it's all uh, a perversion. But God's church is not organized under any denominational head. It's organized under the headship of Almighty God and filled with the Holy Spirit. That's the church of the living God. And it is not organized. It is in the body. It's not organized. It's baptized into the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. In that body made up, it's of Methodists and Baptists and Presbyterians. And all together that's come into Christ. That's right. And these signs shall follow them that has come into Christ. That's what he said. Mark 16. Oh, how I love 
this blessed old gospel. Mark 16, all oh, that just stumbles. That's where Dr. Reed had got his stumbling. When he said, oh, you mean Mark 16 is what you want to see us teachers prove? Well, I said, us better scholars, well, we, we studied a little different from that. We don't believe that part's inspired. And he said, if that's not inspired, then the rest of it's not inspired. And what kind of a Bible do you read? He said, all the Koran's inspired, said the Mohammedan. What a disgrace to Christianity. What a shame to try to make a, a just because you haven't got the faith to stand out and take God at his word and try to lay it onto his word, being something in the past. The disgrace. Just reminds me of a little woman. I kind of stop here for a moment for this. It seems to be fitting just now. There's a little lady that her boy thought that he wanted to be a minister, so the poor little woman done all she could to send him away to a school. And in this great school, while he was away as a student, his mother had taken real sick. So she sends a telegram to the boy to stand by. She had pneumonia, and the doctor said she might die at any time. The boy packed his suitcase to get ready to come home. Then another telegram come. His mother was all right, just a few hours. Well, about a year later, the young man come home on a visit, and he found his mother, and he said, Mother, there's one thing I want to ask you, and I just waited till I got home to ask you said, what's that, son? said, when you had the pneumonia last winter, was just about to die, and I had everything packed to come home. And then all of a sudden, while you sent me a telegram, you were well. Oh, she said, son, I shall never forget that. She said, the doctor told me to send for you because I could die at any minute. And after I had the telegram sent, there was a little woman down the street here goes to a little mission. And she said in prayer meeting that night that she was led to come up and talk to me. And she told me their pastor prayed for the sick and believed in miracles. And said she asked me if she could bring her pastor up. And I said, certainly and said she went and got her pastor and come up and said he read out of the Bible and said that these signs shall follow them that believe. And said he anointed me with oil and she said, you know, within ten minutes my fever began to break. And said by the next morning I was up cooking my breakfast. She said, oh, it was wonderful. Oh, he said, now, Mother, where was this minister from? Said that little mission right down on the... Oh, he said, Mother, said, now, of course, you mustn't get associated with that type of people. Said, because uh, they're just not very well versed. Said, we have learned in the seminary that a little better than that we should associate with. Said in, um, she said, well, honey, he read it right out of the Bible. And Jesus said, these signs shall follow them that believe. If they lay their hands on the sick, they shall recover. And she said, I believed it. And God healed me. Oh, he said, Mother, that was Mark 16 he was reading from. Said, yes said, well, you see, in the, in the seminary, we learned that Mark 16 from the ninth verse on is not inspired. And she said, glory, hallelujah. Why, he said, mother, you begin to act like those people. Shame on you. Why, he said, what's the matter with you? He said, I was just thinking some. Do you mean to tell me that Mark, the 16th chapter of God's Bible, 
it, from the ninth verse on is not inspired? Said, no, it isn't, Mother. It was put in there by a false witness. She said, well, praise the Lord. He said, what's the matter with you, Mother? Said, I was just thinking, if God could heal me with the uninspired word, what could he do with that really is inspired? He said, that's it. We have to believe all God's words inspired. And it all has its right meaning. So all of the false conceptions of the earth, which looks real and looks reasonable, is only a perverted act of the devil from the original plan of God. Right. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth from the mouth of God. So you see, this great Babylon was just a false gathering, a false coming together. But they, in that day, they had collected all the best scientists there was. Now, I'm not trying to support my ignorance, but I want to show you a little something from the Scripture. Did you know where this great intelligence that this world has today, what side of the fence that's on? Do you know where this great pious religion that we serving are supposed to be, you know what side of the fence that's on? It comes from Cain's side. Go back in the Scriptures and read and find out if that's not so. We'll have more to say about it later on. But remember, in the days of Noah, they were scientists and smart men. And all of the great world scientists was on the other side. Always has been. And it is yet today. To make all the inventions and guns and all kinds of discoveries, but you're still working on the other side. God worked in the spirit of His people to manifest Himself, to work Himself through His people to show His presence and His love towards others, God working through man. Now, in this great place, they had great gardens that hung off of the walls, and after they had all the world whipped, as far as they knew, every city was paying tribute to Babylon because they had the smartest scientists in the world. They had the very latest thing in military equipment. They had the highest of everything that could be given in science. They had the smartest people, the best scholars, the best dressed, the best fed of any other nation in the world. Babylon had it. No one fool with Babylon. If you belonged into the Babylonian kingdom, you could walk out and say, I belong to Babylon. Just as you can today say you're an American. Same difference. Something to brag about. It's great to be an American. But it's much greater to be a Christian. But those people down there can say, we've got the best the world's got. we got the best form of government. We've got the best chariots. We've got the best trained man, the best fed people, the best clothed people. And all the world, but they know nothing about God. And they had a city. And in this city, they were just as safe because their science had built a wall 
that were so thick that even they could run a chariot race around that 120 miles and never drive a chariot off the wall. Their gates were at least a foot thick of brass swinging 80 feet high in the air. They didn't have airplanes. So the enemy could only come up to the gate and back off. With all their great men, they could get up on the side of these walls from inside stairways. And if the enemy come there, they could hit the perfect target right at them with their arrows and things. Throwing stones on them. And they had enough territory there, they could shut themselves in and let the enemy wind themselves to death. Because they couldn't get to them. Oh, they felt perfectly safe. They had the best. And it comes to pass that when any nation that forgets God and puts all their hopes upon military might, they're on their road to destruction. God's no respective person. Sin is a reproach to any nation. So while inside these great walls they felt very safe, and I'm just wondering if we haven't been feeling right safe too all in the past 15 or 20 years, 30, 50, we've won every war we went into. We're the best fed nation there is. We wear better clothes than any other nation. We've walled ourselves in with the smartest, the most intelligent man in the world. And so we feel very safe and well fed, fattened, insomuch that we wake, waste enough, wipe off of our plates and tables in the garbage can to feed half the world. Do you think a just God could be pleased with such? Not long ago when I was in India, standing at Bombay at the Taj Hotel. Billy and I were standing there. And off of the ship rolled a great big blue Cadillac with some Americans in it. The little beggars on the street and the little boy with a toe about that big around, about that high. About ten inches around, about a foot high. He was hollering for something to eat. No papa, no mama. And when these well-dressed Americans, worth millions, rolled off of this place, of this little uh, dock place there in this car, walking across towards the Taj Hotel, this poor little boy holding out his hand for just one penny. You know what they done? Turned in that manner. The little fellow said, no papa, no mama, no Edie. And one of them was going to kick him. And the old beggars laying on the street. What good does it do a missionary to go there and say that we're brothers and then act like that? The missionaries had a hard time. What is it? The church. Spending their money for beer and whiskey and great new things and new model homes every two or three years. And the church putting millions of dollars in structure, trying to outdo the Baptists or Methodists or the Pentecostals or whatever more. And you give the missionary a penny march to starve on. You're weighed in the balance and found wanting. And we taken billions of tons of wheat before the other war and dumping it out yonder in the ocean and burning thousands of heads of hogs and cattle on the prairie when the world was starving to death. You think you could get by with that? You see if you can. Oh, doom is at hand. 
God has to show mercy before judgment. But we feel very safe all tucked in like they did. So now notice some of the habits of man when he feels real safe. He forgets God. He forgets all about it. And he gives all his time over to pleasure seeking. Now, I'm not meaning this directly to uh, this people sitting here. But the American people don't want the gospel. They have to be entertained. They've got so much entertainment outside the church so they don't have to go to church. And you, there's no way of telling them you have to make them. We are free Americans. We do what we want to. And their pleasure-crazed mind is so full of Tommy rot of Hollywood and stuff, so they've got no time for the church and Christ. Oh, you'll go on Easter. You don't want to go to hell. Sure not. We're going to speak on that if you unite the Lordship of Christ. But you don't want to be lost. But you won't let Him be your Lord. Are you John Church? Sure. That's the standing good, standing with the rest of the neighbors, the Joneses. You have a conception of what you ought to be. Heady, high-minded lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. Having a form of godliness and denying the power thereof, God said, would be. And you're that. That's what the nation has come to. No wonder Billy Graham just recently made the remark that he did about how the people would rush to the church and make a false cry like they was getting saved and a year and you can't find one out of 30,000 hardly. Follow up, don't do it. It takes God to do it. We can never bring the church under follow up. It's men and women who are thirsting and hungering for God that follows the Spirit. Not follow to the church to get more members. But follow to Christ to get salvation. Uh, this is rough. I don't mean to be rough, but I've got to be honest. I've got to give an account of your soul, you who come out here tonight, at the judgment. So I sure don't want blood on my hands at that day. I want you to be. I want to be honest. Oh, how when people get secured, they want, they just want to do the way they can, and it usually leads into sin. Now look in Babylon. Oh, they had a king down there, just about like some of these here modern movie stars. His name was Belteshazzar. Oh, he was a big time boy. So he thought, we'll close up the gates and we'll just have a big time. And sin was in the city of it, adultery and everything. Women was at low ebb. And motherhood is the backbone of any nation. And look at our American women today. Every three boys that went overseas in the last world war was divorced before six months. I got it in the newspaper. More illegitimate children born in the state of New York than there was man killed in the World War during the same time. Where's the morals of our people gone? It's because they failed God. They went to churches and joined and know no more about God than a hottentot knows about Egyptian night. Now that's true. It's a rude remark. But it's the truth. All they know, I'm a Baptist, I'm a Methodist, I'm Catholic, I'm Pentecost, I'm something else. That don't have one thing to do with your salvation. Not a thing. Then you tell them about, I don't have to go to that, I don't have to listen to such stuff as that. Certainly you don't have to, but you're going to hear God's pronounced judgment one of these days. God help me, you're going to sit in a few minutes. Notice, but they get that way. 
So this big time boy thought, you know, I'm going to have a big blowout. Oh, that's what America loves. Big party. So this big time fellow could certainly do it. So he got one of those modern gardens behind the palace. And he threw a big modern rock and roll party. Certainly he did. Look at it. Just read in the Bible here and see if that's not right. Just the modern Elvis Presley move. It's exactly right. And he invited all of the women that he could get the concubines, which is a legal prostitute. That's all there was. And he got in all of his officers and all the mayors of the city and all the big shops in, and so they closed all the big gates up and stood the guards around the gate just as safe as they could be. And they thought they'd have a real rock and roll. But they failed to see that God looks down from the heavens and He knows sin and He hates sin. And He judges sin. All the time that they were getting their best wine out, their Ertl's 92 is to say, or whatever, you, your beers and things, God was watching every move. And looky here, my friend, if God lets America get by with its big time frolly, to be just, if America can go free without receiving judgment, a just God will have to resurrect Sodom and Gomorrah and apologize for sinking them. Right. He owes Sodom and Gomorrah an apology if we don't receive judgment. Certainly he did. Look what was going on in Sodom and Gomorrah. And man has vice the mercy with his body and has run around with women and women with man until you get the modern statistics of these things. If you don't, you can get them. That perversion is on such a rage until even this claim that a great percent of our capital is homosexual. It's on such a rage in big cities like Los Angeles. So I think each year it goes over 20% from the year before. Narcotics. Opium, smoking cigarettes. Then they get these little teenage girls out and give them marijuana. What do they do? Tell them a little friendly drink. It's got to a place that they know that raises passions in human life. Little boys and girls, so they're becoming completely insane. I was reading your paper today. This little teenage couple down here are killing nine people. What did that? If that boy would have come to Christ by a godly mother and father, that wouldn't have took place. It isn't juvenile delinquency. It's parent delinquency. Because instead of a mother staying home and taking care of her babies like she ought to, she gets some babysitter to do it, and she's out to the bar room somewhere or some big cocktail party. And then call yourself a Christian. Shame on you. You can't be. By your fruits you are known. True. That poor little baby. And then 90% of them don't want children. They'll practice birth control and pay $50 for a little snotty, no, excuse me, little old dog to sit on their lap so they can run around all night. That's where America's got. Some little old stinking dog in a house with a jacket on it and everything like that and practice birth control because you don't want to be tied down. Right. 
Oh, don't think about fifth colonists hurting us. Don't think about Russia taking us. It isn't the robin that pecks on the apple that hurts it. It's the worm at the core. That's what kills the, the apple. It isn't any other nation that we're afraid of. If we had stayed where our forefathers planted the foundation, we'd have been built upon the principles of the Bible. Now you haven't got any government or anything else running four terms and breaking all the Constitution, make their own laws, do whatever they want to. And it's nothing but honeycomb by communism. The government, and you don't know who's who. Why is it sin? And then they had their big times and they got out there. So, you know, this here fellow Belteshazzar was just a very good Arthur Godfrey of the day. So he wanted to have a little religious joke about something. So when they got them all in there, you know, this jokesters. So when they got them all in the room and they begin to drink, some baby sat at home taking care of some woman's baby and her husband out in the army and her on the lap of another soldier. That's it, all of them drinking. Oh, it's, it's just modern. LST or camels or so forth. Modern. It's hellish. Exactly right. And surely if God Almighty will let the things happen in this meeting to prove that he's here and backing it up. Surely I know what I'm talking about because it's coming out of the Word. Certainly. It's a warning. And you just remember that and keep it in your mind. Write it in your Bible. See if it's right or not. Time will tell it. We're on our last pin. Oh, they had a great time. And the soldiers of doing the, the rock and roll and all of them having a big time. And they thought they were very well secured. So the king happened to think of a good joke on religion. Oh, the, the preacher that come through. Or something or another like that. So he wanted to crack some jokes about God's holy things. Oh, isn't that a modern television show? Think of it a minute. So he says, we'll have some fun. Go down yonder and get them vessels out of the house of the Hebrew God, and they drinking wine in them. Oh, just a little religious joke. Don't you see the spirit of Genesis is still here today, only polished up? The same old devil. Excuse me, brother. Same old devil. Oh, it used to be the John Barleycorn. Many of you old people can remember in Prohibition. He looked like a scarecrow. But today he's all shined up. He sits in every icebox nearly, and he's in bumpers now, but he's still John Barleycorn. The same old sinful drug that sends you to hell. But he's polished up. Oh, the devil knows glamour. That's the reason he got in king. That's why he got in Lucifer at the beginning or way back. He wanted something glamorous. Lucifer did. Watch your glamour. Because Satan is the author of glamour. That's thus saith the Lord out of the Bible. All the way down through, look at it. Look at his church. Satan's religious, like his, his son was king. Very religious. Goes to church, pays his tithe, does the offering, kneels down, worships God, just as fair as he can be, sincere as he can be. But there is a way that seemeth right. Your fruits prove what it is. Now let us look now just a minute. Here are this modern jokester, all getting out there and cracking some jokes about the God of heaven, which he thought he was safely. I mean, he was all right to have a little fun out of these girls and things. And all oh, the tapestries was hanging and the confetti up flying and the painted up girls were swinging around in the soldiers' arms. 
just a regular, regular rock and roll, having a big time, not knowing that the eye of God was looking down, the holy God of heaven. God's holiness requires judgment when sin is committed. His own attitude, his own great holiness proves that he must have justice. Now look at them. As they're just whooping it up in a big party and going on like that, thinking nothing about it, and all of a sudden I can see the king just about the time he's got his big joke of going and everything with the wine in his hand, I have a good time. They had been warned of these things. So about time he got ready to take a drink, something happened. Well, how could this be? He's behind, he's got the best scientists, he's got the best wall, he's got the greatest kingdom, he's with the greatest people. How could this be? But you can't hide from God, your sins will find you out. Oh, religious? Sure he was religious. And he happened to notice right over against the candlesticks that were in presence of all, not in a dark room. On the candlestick, the light flickered against the palace wall, there was a man's hand came from heaven and began to write on the wall. Oh, I can see him while the drunken soldiers kissing the women and hoping it up and having a big time. And this big jokester standing there fixing a drink. And all of a sudden, he saw something supernatural. He wasn't used to it. And a man's hand came down and began to write on the wall. I can see him stand. His eyes stared. His body began to quiver. The Bible said his knees bumped together. Oh, he was really all shook up. <laughs> you get shook up one of these days, but weary. It's time now you are. Oh, he was really all shook up. He looked against the wall and he seen that handwriting. Well, he didn't know what to do. So he sent out and got the bishop. And all the pastors. And he brought them in and said, Look here, fellas. You know, we're all good Babylonian brethren. We might differ a little bit, but that's, I want you to read that writing. But you know what? The bishop wasn't used to the supernatural. He knew nothing about it. And so is it today. The handwriting's on the wall. And the supernatural's being done. And the modern preacher knows nothing about it. It hasn't got the answer for them. But I want you to notice, before ever destruction, any destruction ever happened to the world, God sent supernatural signs. Ever F of, or I'd say so you'd understand, junction. Look, the world went all modern for a while, at the birth of Cain and Abel and so forth. The great churches built, they had a little remnant, out of cess people, shepherds, peasants, Enoch, Noah. Watch, as they went along, it come time for the antiluvian destruction, and before God destroyed the world with water, he sent a prophet, he sent angels, he sent supernatural. He had a supernatural revival and a message and a warning. And the people spread it and drowned the whole world in the judgment. Before God taken Israel out of Egypt, what happened? She had laid dormant for hundreds of years. Just her same old priest and the same old ritual. But all of a sudden... What happened? There come a prophet on the scene. Supernatural was done. Signs and wonders appeared. And Egypt drowned in the Red Sea. Because she failed to see the day. And she called the supernatural of God that it was some kind of a natural thing that happened in the earth. Before Jesus comes 
and the destructions of the Jews before Jesus come on the scene. That mighty one. What happened? A prophet arose. Signs and wonders taking place. Angels were seen. Blessed be his holy name. Supernatural prophets and angels at the junction. And here we are again. And the handwriting on the wall. All the time this has been going on, the king couldn't understand. It was a supernatural man in Babylon. The Gentile kingdom was issued in with supernatural. The Gentile kingdom is going out with the supernatural. I'm preaching on the coming in of the Gentiles. That's when the Gentiles first was called into God's people, was in Babylon. Notice, and when King Nebuchadnezzar being the head of gold, the head of the Gentile power, and watch what God did. Look what kind of condition the church was at the end of the King Nebuchadnezzar. When Belteshazzar took his place and the destructions came, Look what took place. A reckless, scientific, idiotic, well-fed, self-styled, rock and roll game. And the supernatural appeared. And they didn't know what it was. And today they don't know what it is. They say a polished up soothsayer or some devil spirit or mental telepathy. They don't understand it. And they won't understand it. But God just, he's got to give the warning first. Certainly he is. There they were. And here he is, they stood in there, all shook up. And here come the bishops and the cardinals and all of them. And they said, we don't know nothing about that. Oh, it's just some little mythical something, but the king knew better. So while he was making his threat, he wondered what was the matter. Then here come the queen in. I want you to notice, she hadn't been in the rock and roll party. She had been out somewhere else. She was one woman in the entire kingdom representing the church that knows something about the supernatural. Watch what she said with all the Jezebels around over the laps of the soldiers and having a big time. And all the men out there at their wives' home walking the floor with the baby, them out with some other man's wife. Just a modern America. So, and their big religious jokes and carry on and their hoop and holler thinking they were safe. And what took place? The little queen run in. And she said, Oh, King, live forever. Don't be all shook up because these formal bishops can't read that. She said, There is a man in your kingdom that knows something about supernatural. There is a man. Brother, there is a man yet tonight. That man is Jesus Christ. He knows all the supernatural, pouring it out into his people. She said, there is a man in your kingdom that your father, Nebuchadnezzar, had over here. And the spirit of the gods is in him. He knows the supernatural. Oh, king, don't be weary. I don't know what the outcome will be, but you go and send for Daniel. That prophet of the Lord, he'll tell this supernatural to you because he's used to it. None of them had the gift of interpretation of unknown tongues, you see. It was right in a language they know nothing about. And they didn't believe that there was any other language besides the ones that they knew about. Oh, what a day we're living in. Notice. So they went and got Daniel. Daniel gazes around as a prophet. No doubt God had showed him that before he left his home. Here he come in, an old man. Perhaps not polished up like some of the young fellows. Rugged, dressed in the beard, hanging, bald-headed, and hanging hairs around his shoulders. Walked in and looked at that supernatural. 
walked right up in the face of that rock and roll jazz boy. He said, you knew better than this. Daniel been preaching a little in Babylon, you know. You knew that in the days of your father, King Nebuchadnezzar, when he acted like this, God made him eat straw like an ox out in the field. And what happened? And these things are not hid from you, old king, and neither is hid from you, Waterloo. It's been in every paper and everywhere, just too self-styled to support it, too self-styled to come out. All right, God does it anyhow. We just have to stand as a post of duty and do our best because God sent it. Been in every paper on the radios and everything, but oh, you know too much about it. Go ahead. If there is something across your heart, you're weighed in the balance and found wanting. If you had the message, if you knew it on your heart, you could tell your congregation. Now watch just a moment what's taking place. And Daniel turned around and he said, Now, King, here is the meaning of teeny, teeny tackle operation. That you are weighed in the balance and found want. You've had your last rock and roll party. Oh, you thought you were safe, didn't you? But just about 30 miles out, history tells us that the Medes of Persians had to get into that wall somewhere. So they had some scientific things too. And for a long time, they had been digging a ditch and had bypassed the river Euphrates. And on that great rock and roll party night, they bypassed the river and drained it out from under there and marched under the walls. Marched under the walls. And then what taking place? While they were all at this big party, drunk and rocking and rolling and carrying on, the guards had been killed at the gate right then. And a godless nation, a heartless nation, just as bad as Russia, was marching through the city at that time. And the guards was killed at the palace. And what happened? In less than an hour, Belshazzar was killed. Those women were taken into the streets and ravished, and their brains busted out against walls, and the whole kingdom perished that night. Oh, they thought they were secure. We have too. We thought we had the best missiles and things in the world. But while we're selling records and got jukeboxes and rock and roll and big time fellows like we are, Russia has put a Sputnik in the sky. The handwriting's on the wall. What's the nation doing? They're trying to make a missile. They got one that fizzled out at three foot off the earth the other day. What are we doing? You don't hear what Billy Graham said a few nights ago? He said, any hour that the Russians desire, we'll be their satellite. Now what's a rock and roll going to be? What's going to take place? They can put a man in a Sputnik. We're five years behind them. That's not strange to you. Your paper says so. Your news commentators. We're five years behind them. They put a Sputnik in the skies and a dog in it and rode him around around the earth. If they can put a dog in it and ride him around the earth, they can put a man in them and stand 500 miles off the earth where we couldn't touch them with nothing and aim their targets down with these hydrogen bombs and missiles, say surrender or what will take place? What would we do? What would take place? Well, to be sensible, we'd surrender. If not, you'll go into a bunch of powder in a little bit. Sputniks, stop them. Try it. Can't do it. The mercy of God will happen before morning. They can do it any time they want to. We ain't got nothing to stop them. We're five years behind them as far as we know, maybe 25 behind them. Other secrets. Then what's going to happen to you? this rock and roll party. If we surrender, 
plane load after plane load, shipload after shipload of cruel, heartless, barbarous Russian soldiers are marching to these streets. They'd ravish our women. They'd strip them. They'd rape them. They'd kill them on the streets. They'll bust the children's heads. They'll run you out of the house. Right? Right in their power to do it. Twenty-five million men in arms. What do they care about you? If they get a home, you, your home, they want it, they kick you out and do what they want to. It belongs to them. We are, we are just a satellite to them. And they can do it. And our nation is standing all shook up. But the church is so dead in sin, it don't know nothing about it. Church hasn't got the spirituality to understand these things. She's dead in sin and trespasses. And God's giving her a shaking at her warning. And they're turning it away. You know what I said? That could be before Sunday morning. These cities could be full of Russian soldiers and doing the things that they did right there on the palace and in Babylon. And it wouldn't contrary Scripture, it would fulfill Scripture. It's right. Russian soldiers, heartless, brutal. Then you'll think about your cold farm or staying home at night and watching We Who Love Susie. Watching all those kind of idiotic things and putting your confidence in some prostitutes out there that's married four or five times and man caught out with colored women and everything else, living in motels, and you make them your idols. And you turn them on your television and let your little children see them. And you run out to bar rooms and go to church and think you're somebody. You're away in the battles in town, Warning. God requires a man to die out to self and be born again by the Holy Ghost. Now what's the supernatural doing? Now do you understand? Can you see why the ministry is battling with all their heart in this last hour? It's a serious thing. See where you're hanging? By morning it may be over. That's true. But let me give you a little encouragement. How many could raise their hand and say this? Brother Branham, I can see where that could be true. Let's see you raise your hand. Now let me tell you something to laugh. If that is that close, and the church is going home before that happens, how close is the coming of Christ then? Glory to God and praise His blessed name. Be filled with His Spirit. Your lamps trimmed and clear. Look up your redemption drawing near. Make your stand for Christ. I wish I had the vocabulary. I wish I had the education. I wish I was prepared and equipped like a minister should be, to make you see it. But you excuse my ignorance. But only what's that the signs of the supernatural that God's letting us read from His Word and pronounce before you? The handwriting's on the wall. It was on the wall then, it's in the sky now. He said, I'll show fearful sights just before the end time, in the sky. And on earth, the sea roaring, tidal waves, never heard of before in the world. Fearful sights, man's heart failing, fear, perplexed of time, distress between the nations. Not one thing left. And the gospel being preached, and Christ manifested before his church, and the church sitting as dead and cold as it can be. Did not the Bible say the church would be like that? Didn't the Bible say they'd be lukewarm in this age? The Lady of Sin, the Pentecostal age, the Lutheran age, the Wesley age, and now the Pentecostal age, they would get lukewarm, neither hot nor cold. He said, I'll spew them from my mouth. But fear not, little flock. It's your Father's good will to give you the kingdom. It's at hand. I know it's a horrible thing to listen to. But you'd rather better listen to it now than wait till it's too late. Listen, men and women, 
I want to lay this before you. Not taking too much of your time. I'm going to pick this up tomorrow night there. That was the advance that went across the earth not long ago. Now I want you to keep this on your mind. The handwriting's here. It's in the sky. Signs in the heaven, fearful sights. On the earth, the sign of the coming of the Lord. Jesus appearing in the last days, doing the same thing he did back there. Never has since the day since he left has he ever done it before. Last any historian, read any book you want to, never, never, never did this. And what's the church doing? Branding it. What? Fanaticism. Heretics. Mental telepathy. Telepathy. Beelzebub. Polished up soothsayer. You better take warning. The supernatural's being done. The handwriting's on the wall. The feast is at hand. What are you doing? Just trotting back and forth to the bar room and around somewhere else and down to the rock and roll party and over to the little formal church and hear the pastor preach on something. Oh, he tickle your ears, sure, certainly. Yes, something because it's a meal ticket. You never hired me to come here. You couldn't fire me because I'm hired of God. Right. No bishop or no archbishop or no church tells me what to preach. I listen to God. I have his message. That's all. I don't take your money. I didn't come for your money. Don't want any of it. I come to warn you in the name of Christ. Make ready. The hour is at hand. It could be before morning. The end of the church age. I don't say it will be, but it could be. I'm only pointing out scriptures and facts. That's only one thing to point out to. How about the returning of the Jews and all these other things? All of it at hand. But you say, well now, wait a minute. If some bishop would tell me that, bishops can't read supernatural many times. God takes the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. It wasn't canvases that passed through the gate called beautiful that healed a crippled man, but it was Peter, an ignorant and unlearned, but they knowed he had been with Jesus. Certainly, when you're with Jesus and belong to Him, the works that Jesus does, you'll do too. He said so. Then what do you do with it, Brand? What are you going to do tonight? If you know that you're that close at hand, oh, you see, you've heard it preached so many times until you think, oh, well, I've heard that before. But you're going to hear it your last time sometime. So had Daniel preached it in Babylon before. But it finally happened. And it looks so close, don't take a chance. For when the last Gentile is brought into the body of Christ, there'll be no room for no more. Why don't you make a stand for him? Why don't you call yourself a soldier? Why don't you confess your sins? You say, Brother Branham, I belong to the Methodist, but I don't care what church you belong to. I'm asking you to accept Christ as, as a, the person of Christ, which is the Holy Ghost, and you that changes your whole attitude. Changes your being. If you haven't got that, you're missing the rapture. You're going to be here for the tribulation. Daniel Green was a great minister about 50 or 75 years ago through the western country. And he preached everywhere. And one night he had a dream. And in this dream, he thought he died. And he went through space and went up to the heavenly gate. And he knocked at the door, and the caretaker came to the door, and he said, Who art thou? He said, I'm Daniel Green the Evangelist. He said, I've preached the gospel all through the United States. I've seen hundreds of men and women come to the Lord Jesus. He said, Let me see, Mr. Green. He said, There's nothing on the book here by the name of Daniel Green. Oh, he said, surely my name's there. No, there's nothing here. Oh, he said, what a disappointment. He said, what shall I do? He said, I can only point you to one thing. That's the white throne judgment. Well, he said, I have no choice. I'll have to take it. Brother, you never want to stand at that place. So he said he went through space for a long time. 
After a while, it began to slow up. It began to get light, lighter, 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 until he came right into the center of a great light. He looked around. There was nobody around him. And he thought, oh, what a place. And he heard a voice say, Who art thou? And he said, I'm Daniel Green. I'm the evangelist. I have preached and I've preached and they failed to find my name on the record at the gate. And they referred me to your judgment throne. All right, Daniel Green, said the voice in the man's dream. He said, I have a law here. And it says that the wages of sin is death. And if you break the least of my commandments, there's nothing left for you but doom. He said, Daniel Green, did you ever tell a lie? He said, I thought I'd been truthful till I was in the presence of that light. And you'll think the same because you're mortal. And you think, well, I'm a pretty good fellow. But if you ever stand in the presence of that light, you'll find out you're a sinner. He said, I thought I'd been truthful, but I found out there that there'd been many things that I wasn't just exactly honest about. He said, yes, Lord, I have lied. He said, Daniel Green, did you ever steal? He said, oh, I thought I'd never stole anything. But said, in the presence of that light, there's a lot of little shady things that I'd done that stood way big. And I knowed I couldn't tell nothing but truth then. Said, yes, Lord, I, I have stole. And said he was waiting to hear that great roar. From out in that light somewhere saying, Depart out of my presence, you wicked person. And said, Then he felt a hand on his shoulder. And said, When he turned to look, it was the sweetest face that he had ever saw. There was no mother's face to take its place. And said, It looked at him and slipped his arm around his shoulders. And it was Jesus. And he said, Father, that's true. Daniel Green on earth done a lot of things that were bad. But Father, while he was on earth in the midst of criticism, in the midst of trouble, he stood for me. And now while he's here helpless, I'll stand for him. Put all his sins to my charge. God be merciful. Let that be William Branham at that day. I want all my troubles. I want to stand for him right now. I want to do everything, no matter how much I'm called holy roller or a uh, witch doctor or whatever it might be or mental telepathy or I don't care what they do. I know God's truth. I know His Spirit and His truth bears record. And I stand for Jesus Christ, looking for Him at that day to stand for me. Let us bow our heads. There's a Sputnik in the sky. There's a handwriting on the wall. There's a rock and roll party in the nation. Fearful sights are happening. Man don't know what to do. There is a spirit calling to the ark of safety with prophetic and supernatural, and the world's making fun of it. Oh, we don't need the Holy Ghost in these days. You just need to be a good church member, be honest and sincere. That's the plea they say. But Jesus said, except the man be born of water and of spirit, he will in no wise enter in. I want to ask you something, church member. First, let's pray. Dear God, one of these nights I'm going to have my last message. 
I'm going to close this old Bible the last time. And the church is going to make its last prayer. And all of a sudden there will be a scream from heaven. A daddy will wake up some morning and look for wife and she'll be gone. He'll run to the cradle for baby and baby's gone. He'll call the pastor. The pastor's gone. Oh, Lord, what will their little records and little parties mount to then? What will all their impersonation, what will all their going to church mean then? Not a bit. Won't count nothing. God, you have even done something in this building that you've never done in my presence before. And if ever any time in, since the days of the apostles, I've never read of it or heard of it. What is it? This stiff and cold city. This indifferent. People who's plenty work. Got lots of money. Something's bound to take place. Oh, eternal God, shake man tonight and women before judgment shakes them. May they come to mercy and make a stand for thy son, Jesus. And instead of standing out there for some membership or standing for some something that's not right, grant it, Lord. Have mercy, Lord, one more time. From henceforth then, Lord, I shall just pray for the sick in the city, close the book and leave. But tonight, with all that I know how I've tried to warn the people, grant, Lord, that your Spirit will now take over and do the rest of the warning. Through Jesus Christ, with our heads bowed just a moment, I'm talking to sinner and to church member. What if it would be alarmed tonight on your radios that this nation has surrendered to Russia? Couldn't help it. Or what if they say no? Then all of a sudden there will be a breath of wind, not like you felt the other night. But it will be in a hydrogen blast, and the whole nation will be sunk into powder. That spirit-filled Christian won't be here. No, no. He'll be gone a few minutes before that. But what if we do have to surrender to them? Remember, when that takes place, you can scream and cry and do all you want to. It's too late then. You spurn mercy, only judgment's left. Sure, Balthasar would have repented. Them women would run home to their children. They'd have forsaken all those old doctrines they had. And I believe the God of Daniel. But they, it's too late. It might be too late for you before morning. It might be too late for you before you leave the building. You may go in a heart attack. You may be killed in an accident before you get home if the Lord doesn't appear. What about that soul of yours, friend? Do you realize there's not a thing here left on earth? The nation is honeycombed with communism. The world all over is gone. Every nation's crumbled. Why, wow, there's coming an eternal kingdom. All the mortal gives away to it. There's not a thing that we can do about it. Everything that can be shook has been shook, but we got a kingdom we're introducing you to that cannot be moved. The governor and king is Christ. Is your heart right with him tonight? Would you stand for him tonight, that he could stand for you in that day? If you want to accept him in the fullness of his spirit, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand while the rest of the real church that's filled with the spirit, living close to God and the fruits of the spirit is coming after you, bearing record, all your worldly habits is gone, all your enmity, all your strife, all your temper, all your everything passed from you. You believe every word of God. You believe everything the Bible says. Christ is sweet to you. Walk with Him daily. If you're not, this may be your last chance. The handwriting is in the sky where Christ said it would be. And the supernatural is being done here in Belteshazzar's palace where the rock and roll is going on. Oh, 
Oh, sure, they had preachers. They had all kinds of religion. Are you right with God? If you're not, with your heads bowed, would you raise your hand just a moment, saying, Brother Branham, remember me in prayer just now. Uh, now, God bless you, sir. God bless you, lady. You, you. Way back, yes. God bless you to the right. That's being sincere. Someone else, put up your hand now. God bless you. Someone else, God bless you. That's right, you. That's be honest. Let's look at this right exactly what it is, friend. I'm not reading out of some almanac. I'm reading to you God's Word. That couldn't be nothing else but the Holy Spirit here every night doing the same thing that Jesus did when He was here on earth. It can't be no more than the religious world rejecting it now just like they did in the days of Noah, like they did to the Lord Jesus, like they did to Lot in Sodom, like they did to Moses in Egypt, like they have at every junction, and here we are. Don't take a chance on it. If you're not born again of the Spirit of God, put up your hand and say, Lord, be merciful to me. I want to be. God bless you. You. Someone who hasn't put up their hand now. God bless you and you and you, lady. Yes, that's right. You back there. Friend, you know what's happened here. You seen that little girl last night with one leg about four to six inches short of the other. The Lord healed and brought up here. You seen that little child wrapped in them braces over her little hips walk right to the platform herself. Seen that little deaf boy and all them other things take place. You've seen the Holy Spirit come down, move into the audience, and tell the secrets of the hearts just exactly the way Jesus did and just exactly what He said would take place before His coming. You were sure that night, many of you, that hear that sound visible, audible, like they did on the day of Pentecost. Come down here, seen it, felt it, moved through the building, watched the works of it, doing the same thing He did when He come the other time. And here we sit in a starchy, cold, indifferent place. What about it? It's up to you now. If you don't receive Christ tonight, your blood's not on my hands. I'm offering you Christ. You who want to receive Him, I wonder if you've got confidence in me as God's servant. If God will hear my prayer to open the eyes of the blind, to do signs and wonders and miracles and see visions and help the poor and needy of the sick and afflicted, surely He'd hear my prayer for your soul. Certainly he would. If you're sincere and you want me to pray for you, I want you that raise your hand and you that didn't raise your hand and know you should sit, walk up here, stand right here, let me pray for you. I want to shake your hand and stand here, lay hands on you, pray for you. Come now, won't you do it? Someone raise right up and walk right down here. I'm offering you. I'm waiting. Just as I am without one leaf. God bless you, lady. Now, in your heart, each one of you, in the own way that you pray in your church, and if you have no church, never have been in church before, I want you just to talk like you were talking to a man. Like you were coming to him for something, and then go to thanking him. Say, I, I thank you, Lord. My heart was cold and hard, but something struck me. Now, I'm not coming here because of fear. I'm coming here because I love you, and I want to be with you forever. And I something warned me in my heart. No man can come except my father draws him. And I felt some kind of a drawing power telling me I ought to go up there tonight. And I've come now to accept what you're going to give me here at this altar. If you're sending the Holy Spirit upon me, I'm not going to look for any certain kind of evidence or anything. I'm just going to receive it just the way you sent it to me. That's the way I'm going to receive it. Whatever you want me to do, I'm going to do it. I'm your servant. I'm standing here now. I want to make my start right from this night on. I'm through with sin. I'm through with unbelief. And I'm going to get in the ranks of God's children and serve Him as long as I live. You say that in your heart while we pray. Now, Lord, I know that you're, you're not hard hearing, that I'd have to pray real loud, or any of us pray real loud, although many times people do pray real loud. Their hearts are bubbling, or their heart is torn up, 
and they express their feeling by their emotion. But, Father, we're not asking for any certain way, but I'm just asking you to take these people just as they've come and let that spirit that swept down across this same little banister the other night May it touch every person that's standing here now in divine presence. May every doubt be moved back. And may the Holy Spirit take its position and its place in each heart. May these sinners and these church members that's never had an experience of knowing what it means to pass from death unto life, pass from the things of the world into this great holy realm to live with God, May they receive it just now. May the Holy Spirit come in great power and renew their lives and give them the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Lord, unction as your ministers. May the power of the Holy Spirit get on every member that's standing around these others now. And may there be a great, powerful conviction that the end is near then that we should work together in fellowship for the kingdom of God. Granted, may every superstition, every doubt, leave these people, and may they, every one in here, every one that's standing here, be rewarded for their coming to the altar. Grant it, Lord, as these servants of yours, both men and women, are laying hands on these penitent children. O oh God! Let the Holy Spirit that saved them come to their bodies, to these people, and may they be saved upon their confession now and be filled with the Spirit of God. I thank you for it, Father. You said it would be so. He that will come to me, I will in no wise turn him out. Then if you said it, it's the truth. And just now, I believe that the Holy Spirit is saving every person that's in here, giving them an experience that the beautiful Lord Jesus in the form of the Holy Ghost is taking them souls from death unto life and giving them of thy own spirit to live by from this night henceforth. I praise you for it, Lord, for I believe that you are doing it right now. Now to you with your heads bound that stood at this altar that walked from your seat, Jesus said, He that heareth my words and believeth on him that sent me hath eternal life. There's only one type of eternal life. Anyone knows that? Only one kind of eternal life, and that's the Holy Spirit. If you've got eternal life, you can't die. Because you're eternal as the Spirit that's in you eternal. So he that heareth my words and believeth on him that sent me hath right now, present tense, eternal life and shall never come to the judgment, but it's already passed from death unto life. You that's standing around the altar here, that come up here a few moments ago, that accept that and believe that you have felt in your being the transformation of the Holy Spirit, letting you pass from death to life, raise up your hand. That's right. God bless you. Every one of them with their hands up. Oh, my. I don't know how you feel, but I feel wonderful. What a blessed thing. Friends, I'm sure you, this is it. This is what revivals are held for. There's people who would have died and been lost ten minutes ago. They're saved now and on the road to glory. How we thank the Lord Jesus for his goodness. Now, in behalf of the present here, don't leave the plus spot now. I want the sister to give us a, an organ tune. Blessed be the tie that binds our hearts in Christian love. Now, I want you ministers to wind yourself right amongst these people and shake hands with them if they're in your community. Come to your church. Give them an offer to your church. They're God's children. All together, all over the building now. All right. Bless be the time. Now, shake hands. Walk right in here now. Our heart. That's right, ministers. Walk right in here now and shake hands with these people. The bell. 
fellowship of kindred mine is like to that above before our father's throne we pour our and prayer our fears our hopes our aims our one that's right just shake hands with one another now all of you together our and our kids are when we asunder part. A poor crippled woman is standing here, is waving her hands to God she saved. How we thank the Lord for that. I believe God will heal her before the services is over. Oh, how wonderful. Isn't this wonderful? All the rest of you out there, stand up on your feet now and turn around, shake hands with each other now while we sing this glorious old song together. All the people, all different denominations, shake hands with somebody in front of you, behind you, right and left. All right, all together. Bless be a tie that binds our heart in Christian love. Uh, here's ministers up here talking to these people. That's right. Turn around and shake hands, everybody. Tender mind is like to that above before others throne. Oh, we pour our fears, our hope, our aims, our one, our comforts and our cares. That's wonderful. Now everyone turn looking this away. Everybody now, look this away. Raise up your hands. Give us when the battle's over. Everybody now. When the battle's over, oh, we shall wear the crown. Yes, we shall wear the crown. Yes, we shall wear the crown. And when the battle's over, oh, we shall wear the crown in the new Jerusalem. All of you's got a handkerchief now. Take it out. Crown. Wear a crown, wear a bright and shiny crown. All right, up with it now. And when the battle's over, oh, we shall wear the crown in the new Jerusalem. Must Jesus bear the cross alone? And all the world go free. No, there's a cross for everyone. And there's a cross for me. All right now. And when the battle's over, we shall wear the crown. Yes, we shall wear the crown. Yes, we shall wear the crown. And when the battle's over, we shall wear the crown in the new Jerusalem. I want all of you, does anybody here know what the word, the Hebrew word, hallelujah, means? It's in every language in the world the same. In the Hottentots in Africa, to all languages, it's, the translation is the same. Hallelujah means praise our God. Now let's all say hallelujah to God. Hallelujah. Let's say it again. Hallelujah. Now again. Hallelujah. Now in English, praise our God. Amen. Now bow your heads just a moment. We are thankful, God, 
for this visitation. May these gallant souls live peaceful with you as long as life is in their body, then come home to your house. Grant, Lord, now in the following service tomorrow night, O oh Lord God, move on the scene. Ride on the waves of the wind. Come down the horizontal rainbow. Get in the wheel and the wheel. Turn into every heart. Go in the city tomorrow, Lord, and bring out those. And grant that the closing of this revival, after it's been so hard and you've done so many things, grant that it will close with one of the greatest things that we've ever saw. Grant it, Father. Now, with our heads bowed, I'm going to turn to service to Dr. Vale. The prayer cards will be at 6.30 tomorrow night. God bless you. Dr. Vale.